Hi, and thank you for joining us for our first webinar event, The Value of Creativity. Uh, my name is Alyssa Call, and I am a music business major at the Los Angeles College of Music. Uh, and I am joined by these wonderful people as well. Hi, I'm Zoe Fontenelle. That's my name. Um, and I'm also a student <laughs> at Los Angeles College of Music. I'm also a singer-songwriter. And uh, yeah, Alyssa, why don't you uh, go ahead and introduce our wonderful members here. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to. Uh, originally from the UK, we are joined by Richard Harris, who is a number one selling songwriter, producer, and mentor, and has had a lot of placements in TV and film, uh, such as uh, the movie This Means War, uh, the shows such as uh, One Tree Hill, Good Trouble, and The Bold Type. Good to be here. First webinar for Songwriter Camps. Love it. Thank you, ladies. This is great. Thank you for being here. And we also have the illustrious Pam Shane. She is a multi-platinum songwriter who has shown that it is possible to have a long, fruitful career in the industry. She, she co-wrote Christina Aguilera's first hit, Genie in a Bottle, and has worked with artists including Seal, Jason Derulo, Demi Lovato, Camila Cabello, and Kareem Bailey Ray. She's also written for TV and has end titles and films like The Princess Diaries, Young Victoria, and Confessions of a Teenage Drama Queen. She is a veteran songwriter, a board member of SONA, that's Songwriters of North America, and I cannot wait to learn from her today. Uh, give it up. <laughs> Thank you so much, ladies. It's so great to be here. And uh, yeah, we're looking forward to digging in and talking about uh, the value of creativity. Yeah, so excited. Yeah, so this webinar, like you mentioned, is called The Value of Creativity. And when I think about the value of my creativity, I think about myself as a young artist. And I have to promote on social media platforms in order to get my music heard. But where would you say is the line between self-promotion and giving my art away for free? Like, is there a way to maximize my worth as a music creator? And that's a really great question. Uh, and I think that, um, I think the question kind of changes and, and how you use your your product really, your music as, as you move through your career. Certainly in the beginning, I think you have to kind of get used to the idea that, you know, your music becomes um, some sort of has a value, not necessarily just as in terms of streaming or making selling CDs or whatever you're doing, doing shows. Um, I think it's also a way for you to connect to people and build your audience. Um, so that I think there's a fine line between giving it away for free just for the sake of giving it away for free or actually using that as a, as a vehicle to draw an audience to you. I think, you know, thankfully in, in this day and age, if you're streaming, you are going to be receiving some reward for streaming audio, your songs on Spotify, uh, YouTube, whatever it is. And they obviously, you know, we, we're in the middle of a big debate about what songwriters are paid in terms of streaming rates. But if you own your masters, then you're going to be starting to receive um, revenues on masters. So you're kind of covered on that side. I think a lot of um, a lot of what's going on on the live side, there is obviously the debate about pay to play. I think again, you have to make the decision about what is the end result that you're trying to get, and what is your music going to be as part of that uh, achieving that end result. And sometimes you are going to have to play a couple of coffee shops, and to kind of get your first taste of being in front of people live and they may not pay you, but they are giving you an audience. And that's where you begin. And then from there you build out and out and out. And then obviously, um, then you have to make a choice about deciding, well, if I wanna play in a big show, well not a big show, but a fairly reasonable size show in LA, um, then you have to have this, this negotiation really. And I think it's all about using your music as leverage in terms of getting what you want out of it. I think it's all about audience size and things like that. I think if you're trying to book a bigger show and you just don't have an audience, then you're gonna pretty much fall on your face in terms of grabbing another show like that from the same venue. Um, so I think it's a, it's a multifaceted idea of what you'd move along as you go through your career. 
Um, and you know, there's going to be a time when maybe you do play a show and you give away free CDs in the beginning just because you're creating an audience. And that's what you're using that revenue of your music for to promote yourself and put it in. But if you're still doing that when you've got 1500 people turning up, that probably wouldn't be a wise idea. Um, so I think, um, I think it's use it as a way to leverage the sort of idea of where you want to be and what you want to get out of it. Um, and uh, that will be the best way to promote. But you know, giving away for the free for the sake of giving it away for free is probably not a wise idea. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, in the history of music, there's never been many as many platforms as there have been today in where to put your music. And I think as a music creator, you have to figure out where does my music fit in? What? How can I make money out of um, what I do? Whether it's session singing, whether it's touring, live work, you know, uh, jingles, all of those things. Um, and I did that when I first started out. I started out doing pub gigs and um, cover gigs and then ended up doing jingles and session work, touring. So, you know, there are so many places for your music. You have to figure out, okay, where does it fit? And, um, and, and put value to your to yourself, otherwise nobody else is going to value it. It's a very yeah. saturated market out there. So, um, you know, figure out what your budget is and um, figure out how many songs you can afford to put out in a year um, and work really, really hard on those. Um, yeah. It's a multifaceted uh, question, so um, you know a, a lot to discuss there. Really. Yeah, and it's not just about your music. Pam Ray raises a really interesting point in terms of you know if somebody comes to you as a singer and says, "I want you to sing on my track," you know that's going to be a negotiation. I wouldn't give that away for free at all unless. There is massive traction attached to either the producer or the people that you're getting involved with. That then has a value to it, right? It has a return value. It's not dollars and cents, but it also is about attracting people to you and getting, you know, and getting credits is such a big part of what we try and do here. It's like the bees around a honeypot thing, you know. It's if you start to build up a reputation as a, 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 a professional that's prepared to work hard and do the gig sometimes doing that kind of gig and say yeah okay that's this sounds like a this could be a really cool for me um, I'm not going to get paid but I am going to get a little kickback in terms of revenue for being a featured vocal on and maybe for instance a dance record or something like that and you, you kind of revenue share in the streaming and all that sort of stuff that could be a good way um, to use your talent uh, and, but it's going to be difficult in the beginning because you don't have a reputation and you're trying to build that reputation. So you use your talent and your music to leverage those opportunities. And once you've got that, then things change because as you become a lot more, you know, recognized, then of course your perceived value goes up and then you can start charging uh, more better fees and, and obviously start to get the rates that uh, you, you deserve. And, and if I could just, sorry. <laughs> yeah, sure. No like, worries. <laughs> um, just, you know, the best piece of advice I think I could give anyone is any industry that you're going to get into, you need to educate yourself on how it works and empower yourself with um, different facets of the industry so that you, you know, you know, okay, well, okay, so streaming is not the greatest of incomes um, for just a songwriter right now. So why don't I go concentrate on film and TV? Why don't I put myself out there as a vocalist and, and work on um, trying to get into jingles or adverts or what, whatever, you know, whatever it is you can can do, bring, bringing all your skills to the table. Yeah. And I'm, while I'm there, um, you know, uh, SONA is a Songwriters of North America uh, fighting for songwriters' rights. It's an organization that um, was put together by songwriters that, um, you know, are trying to... Um, get the best for songwriters and streaming rates, um, you know, on all sort of sides of that because we can't join a union. We can't start a union. So um, join as many organizations as you possibly can. Go to as many expos and songwriter festivals and, um, 
and just put yourself out there and network. Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess to um, kind of, uh, you kind of already started going into it, which is really great uh, in the next question that we have. Uh, with all of that, like joining a bunch of organizations, joining uh, like and really putting your work out there, how much grunt work in a way do you think is needed in order to become credible? Like how much work, like smaller projects, music putting out and everything like that do you have to do to be perceived as credible creditable in the industry um and really like have your name known as a songwriter in the industry uh, i would do everything <laughs> you know <laughs> if you, if this is your passion and what you really want um show us how bad you want it you know you gotta you gotta go to every <laughs> my uh, my husband who was my manager um used to take me to uh, every single music uh, convention function there possibly was to get my face around to start meeting new uh, collaborators and you know industry people and and it's a good thing to do you you want to be known and you want to find the best people you possibly can to work with so yeah take every opportunity you possibly can to um, to, to and go for it there's no such thing as an overnight success <laughs> no there isn't yeah. and 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 to be honest with you that journey can be different for everybody i think it's a it, it really can be a, a slow burn it can be a quick burn but it, it, to be honest with you up to the point where it hits there's always tons of work that's been going on and um, i think the shortcuts if there are any is building up your network of people i think you know, you can write a million songs and still not have any connections to send them to. And you could have written a lot of great songs at that point and still you are not known and you're not getting anywhere because you've not created this network, this outlet for you to take your music to. And I think, you know, you can be strategic about it as well. I think, you know, in the early days, you're writing for the sake of writing. You're writing because you're passionate about it and you're just writing songs and you're learning the craft. And then I think you can start to get a little bit more strategic about that. I think you can start carving out little, and it obviously depends on what your day gig is and how much time you have in your week, um, is about finding outlets for your music because that's vital. Um, and, and that will be either through an artist, if you're a songwriter, uh, building teams, for instance, saying you, okay, work with certain artists, certain producers to create content, your own artist career maybe, which is another avenue, and then maybe a team that's based around film and TV, and then you then go to all these events and you start building up, A, those collaborators, and secondly, these outlets for it. And, and as I said in the previous question, once you've built up sorts of any sort of like connection to a success which would be i got a small placement in a promo for a you know chemical company for their you know for their their meeting when they go out and have conferences right that's a very small placement however it's a placement so if you start once those things start adding up it creates interest and so you just have to be a little strategic of finding those teams, finding those collaborators, finding those outlets so that you then one thing will land and then something else will land and it will all be coming in from various different areas while you're still building up your skills as a songwriter. And uh, so again, that journey can be quite long and it, and, and it will change. It will, I'll be honest with you, it will come down to it sometimes meeting one human being who can make all the difference and you just have to put yourself in enough places to meet that person it was how it changed for me i met one particular person that changed what happened to me as a writer but if you then looked at all the connecting dots that were leading up to it it was a hell of a journey all the people that i had to talk to all the things that i had to do to meet that person at that crossroads and when you do everything can change, you know. Yeah, I, to I totally agree. Um, I've learned to look at the end game first and go, okay, um, so why are we getting together? Why are we getting together to write today? 
Who's in the room? Okay, so we've got an artist, a producer. Um, what can we write for? Um, what are our skills and, and where does our music fit? And that is sometimes really helpful in, um, in, in helping you, uh, yeah, figure out where, where it's going to be placed or where you can pitch it to. Um, Project-based stuff is awesome. If you've got, you know, a load of different collaborators do a project for this, like Rich said, do a project for that. Um, you know, and and look into these different areas of songwriting um, in your artistry and, and do your research. Yeah. Sometimes I will meet different like music creators around me you know go to music school and <laughs> <laughs> happens often um and i'll be like talking with them and then like in the back of my mind i'll be like should i like is it kind of could they be a collaborator could they be a person i could work with like and sometimes i don't like that thought sometimes i don't like that i'm thinking of people as like pieces to, like things to work with instead of a possible friend um and sometimes i that feels a little like not nice what how do you how do you but you know if you're if you were going to find a friend if you were going to like kind of find a person to build a relationship with in the, in in an artistic way and then you're like oh we do have that spark together that can that we can make good work here you know how do you discern between those two feelings if if you do feel that way. Do you want me to jump in on that one, Pam? Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. I, I, I honestly, I think, again, it's going to be down to how you're comfortable you feel doing it. Um, I, I think I think starting off as really getting to know people is probably a great way to start. I, I think, you know, you need to know that people kind of think the same way as you do, kind of probably listen to some of the sort of music you do, or at least are as inspired by music as much as you are and what their goals are. I think you can... You know, it's not all about, you know, oh, let's get together because we're just going to make a million dollars and we're just going to crush it. it you know, we're, we're to begin with, you're going to try on a lot of different collaborations and you will find the people that you fit with. And sometimes it will be a it might not be the friends. It might be somebody that you've never really done anything with before. Sometimes you'll have a great mate and then you go get into a room to write together and it just doesn't work for some reason, you know, it, it, the spark isn't there. So I think, you know, don't, I don't, I think it's very important not to see everybody that you meet as an outlet to, to help you step up into the, to the, into your career. I think as soon as you start doing that, yes, you're going to start getting yourself into some trouble. Professional people smell that a thousand miles off, to be honest with you. I think, um, and that's writers, I've been around the block a few times and, and Pam's been doing this a while and, and I, you know when people are not really coming to you to kind of like, you know, create something, they're just trying to use you as a stepping stone to get to the next level. And I think it's very important that you build up a relationship first because there are some, you know, interesting characters in the music business, you know, like musicians can be quite weird at times. And, uh, and there's a lot of ego built into this whole business as well. And, uh, and sometimes it's more ego than talent. And, and you need a bit of both, to be honest with you. But I think you have to be careful not to ever see everybody as a, as a, as a stepping stone or a way to move forward. However, it, it's important that you do find people that you work well with. And that could be sitting in a bar talking with a group of people. And then you just realize, wow. I really dig how you see the world and that's how I see the world and maybe we should get together and write about it sometimes, you know? So I, I think that would be, uh, I, I think it's important. I think it's a good qu question to raise because you don't want to be seen as that person that's just trying to manipulate their way through the business. Right. So there's a difference between looking for a collaborator versus like seeing them as a tool for your advancement. Uh, uh, absolutely. And and look that, you know, you'll come across those people and, and, and you know, look, it's, it can't it will become mutually agreeable that you are going to be helping each other out. You know, there'll be things that you can do 
in terms of creating connections that the other person won't but they'll have connections that you won't so everybody helps each other out but I think if you're using people to just throw a grapple hook onto and then you know be dragged up through their wake I think it's going to be a is not the way to go about it yeah I, I think it's you, you can boil it down really to the basic human skill of being interested in people and um, just finding out more about them. You know, that's what you do when you meet a friend. Um, you know, the great thing about songwriting is, um, you know, you meet so many incredible people in your career and you become friends with them. Um, and it sort of started out on a, on a business side of things, but you really, you really care about these people because they've become a part of, part of your life. So yeah, um, think more on the human side of, of, I just want to get to know this person and know what they do and, and um, you know, and then uh, after all that and you like them, then you're going to want to spend more time with them. So, you know, like what you said, say, hey, let's, let's get together one day and, and write something if you're up for it. And you will find the people that you meet along the way that may not ever become collaborators. One day will pick up the phone and go, hey Zoe, hey Alyssa, guess what? I just met somebody and they are the perfect connection for you. You need to, because you're, they've been looking for your kind of style, looking for you as a, as a songwriter, artist, blah, blah, blah. And that's happened to me a bunch of times. Just having friends and connections across not only the music part of it, but also the, the business side of it. People just pick up the phone. I get calls like that often where people go hey rich i'm just talking to somebody and and i think you'd be the the right fit for this collaboration you should you know can you can i connect you and i go absolutely so that's also part of it you just don't know where people are going to connect dots for you and the more of these people that you are friends with and you're connected to it will change a lot for you as your career you know progresses yep Totally agree. Um, you know, finding a champion is, yeah. is important on the business side, on on even the creative side. Champions are great to you know. So if you're likable and uh, people like working with you, then you're going to get a lot of recommendations. That's a huge thing. What Pam just said, massive. Be a friend to people. Build up a good reputation. I'm telling you this now. You, there are talented people out there that switch everybody off and they the phone stops ringing. Uh, and I know people personally that have messed things up because they just, their ego just gets way out of, sh bent out of shape and it can it destroy things. Just be a reliable source and, and people will reach out to you, you know, even if you're not the most talented. You know, sometimes they just go, I want somebody to do the gig and get it done and not bring any drama to the table because that, uh, that can destroy everything for you. Yeah, yeah and even suggest, sorry, they even suggest uh, uh, being a connector to somebody. You yeah. Know, helping people because, you know, you may, they may not help you back right after you help them, but a year down the line, they go, oh, Zoe would be able, you know, be able to write with this person. This would be a perfect person. Yeah. Celebrate other people's victories, you know, be, be their yeah. biggest supporter. Uh, and because we, we should do a lot of that. We get so wrapped up in ourselves in this business, I think, we forget to champion other people and say, hey, that was really cool. Even though sometimes you might burn because you think, I think I was after the same gig and I lost out to them. You know, you can still write them a note and say, that's amazing. And I've done that before, where I know somebody beat me to the, to the, to the gig and it was like, and they're a friend. It was like, the first thing I do, write to them, man, I'm so, so glad you guys got, got that gig, you know, so. Yeah. Anyway, it's good to make, good yeah. to make friends for sure. And oh yeah, forward with humility. Yes. I just wanna uh, before we move on to the next question, I just wanted to say if you guys have any uh, questions you'd like to ask uh, out there watching the live stream, just feel free to put it in the chat and we will get right to it. Thank you, Zoe. Yeah. Yeah, and to go along with that, I I count myself very fortunate that I get to be around so many creative people all the time. Now that I live down here in LA. I, uh, like, especially at school, like Zoe probably knows as well, we get to be around so many creative individuals every single day. And I, I often find myself comparing um, 
like, oh, this person released like a full EP, and like they got it done in just a few months, and they're just like cranking out the music as much as they possibly can. And it just makes me want to know, like, it, it asks the question, like, how often she released music to keep up with other artists, not only the ones that are like artists like me who are smaller, who are definitely releasing a lot more music than I am at the moment, but um, also bigger artists. Like, you see artists like Ariana Grande releasing two full albums in a year, uh, which is crazy <laughs> to me. So uh, what do you guys think on that? I say, uh, firstly, try not to compare um, yourself to other artists because you're different. And, um, you know, it's different, different circumstances for everybody. You know, Ariana Grande has a fabulous marketing budget <laughs> and a right. record company machine behind her. So, um, you know, we have changed the way we listen to music. It's uh, more disposable, you know, if, if you like, if that's a good word. But, um, you know, our attention span these days <laughs> is crazy because we are just so out of dated with, with music and games and videos and this and that. So it's hard to know how to how to meet that fine balance, I think, of, of um, how much do I release. Um, again, I think it, it's down to, you know, what's physically possible for you to to uh, set up in a year, how many releases you want to do, maybe have a goal of, okay, I'm going to release four singles this year or three singles or whatever, whatever it is. Um, figure out what your budget is, find out if you can afford to do that, um, who you're going to collaborate with it on, and don't worry about anyone else and what anyone else is doing. Um, you know, find your own flow and beat. Yeah, I think that's really important. I think you have to, I think you have to know what your available time is based on other commitments, family commitments, work commitments, college commitments, you know, there's there's a whole bunch of stuff that draws time away from, you know, it, scrolling through Instagram, obviously, there's at least half an hour a day, you've got to say, um, just all jokes aside, that I think it's, I think you can drip feed your audience and I think that's an important thing and it doesn't have to be songs, a song after song after song and it doesn't have to be produce song after produce song after produce song. I think if you can build out a plan where you go, look, physically it's going to be impossible for more and, and obviously financially as well, I can only produce 10 songs a year. I'm just using an number, arbitrary number. Then you think, how do I keep my audience engage this talking purely as an artist here right is how do I keep my audience engaged between those releases well there is a million things that you can be doing you could even just do work in progress videos on TikTok on Instagram Jack Garrett who's an amazing artist from the UK um, who's had you know ridiculous success in the UK not so much over here but is a wonderful go check him out he's a genius he goes on Instagram and he goes I'm writing this song right now what do you think I mean literally and it will be just this half-baked idea but it's something for his fans to go ah oh, and it's given them input too which is even better you know what I mean it's like for them to go well I, I like it I don't like it or and then you'll post something the next day you can then think about your ecosystem as an artist what how is it how does that look it doesn't have to be just music you know you could through the visual x you know um, visual sort of outlets that you have with TikTok Facebook Instagram you know the like you can walk around your city and take a picture of something and go that inspired me and you can write a couple of lines about it teach your audience about how you see the world because they'll learn a bit about you as a, as a human and they will buy in more to the music that way if it's just sterile me dropping songs please listen that kind of becomes a one-way sort of street then and I don't think it should be that way. It's not like, please listen to me, please listen to me. It's like, this is how I see the world and this is the things I think are right and these are the things I think are wrong. And you can engage with your audience between those releases that you're physically only able to do so many a year. 
Um, so get inventive with that sort of stuff. You know, it, it doesn't have to be just a bunch of music. It can be vignettes of music. It can be you doing something acoustically for once. Say, hey, I dropped that song two, what, two months ago. I've never really done an acoustic version of it and sit down and play it. Um, so there's, there's plenty of other things you can feed your audience to keep them entertained between releases. That's, that's the way I would play it as an artist if I was an artist anymore, which I'm not. So. Couldn't agree more, Rich. Mm. That's that's great advice. You know, you don't want to put you don't want to put something that's mediocre out because you didn't have enough time to get it done. But it's a song. It's okay. But it's you want to put out your greatest work. Yeah. Because it's gonna be around forever. Remember, yeah. it's gonna be on the internet for it. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that that's really important because I'm like, do I put out the whole thing i still want people to you know go and find it and listen to it and love it as much as i do so yeah thank you so much it's very valuable i'm taking notes um <laughs> we, we talk about you know making relationships having collaborators but the communication with your collaborators is also really important and i know that i can struggle with talking about the money about the percentages the splits you know the the the, the grit of the of why we're doing this not why we're doing it but why we're doing it you know we have to make a living um so i have had some difficulty discussing splits uh in the few collaborations that i have do you find it difficult discussing that with your co-writers and when would you say is the best time to pop the question so to speak <laughs> <laughs> um pan you can talk about that one okay <laughs> Um, it is a tricky one. We all find it really uncomfortable to, you know, especially with new people. I mean, you know, um, you know, walking into a new co-write is is hard because you don't even know that person and you, you don't want to go, so, <laughs> so how, how much am I getting? Right. <laughs> you know, it's kind of, it's icky. But um, there are ways of doing it. So rule of thumb, if you're in the room with three people, you split it evenly three ways. Whether the one person's bought 20% to it, 30% to it, 2% to it, it's just the way it is. You know, it works out in the wash somehow if you work with that person again or, or not. Um, it You just do it that way. Um, and if you're working to a track, it's a different sort of scenario, you know. Um, firstly, you have to figure out how many people wrote that track? Because uh, you don't want to get any surprises at the end, and that's happened to me, where um, you know I've written a song and it's got cut, and then I find out there's an extra person on it. It's like, hang on a second, I thought I was getting uh, you know 50%, and it, it's not the case. So always do your homework on that and go, hey, love this track. Um, who you know who composed it and um, and how many writers were there on it, and what is available. For the top line, if you're doing a top line, what what is the available split that's a you know for for the rest of the song? So that's always a good idea. If you're in the co-write situation, you've finished a song um, in a day, uh, and you've not written with that person before, um, you know, I'd probably it's a tough one. But if you if you felt comfortable saying hey, you know, we've never written together before, so I'm not quite sure how, how it works, how you do it. Um, you know, are we, um, is it all equal splits here? Are you cool with all equal splits? And, and at least it gets it out in the open and you don't walk away and never know what it is because you have to find out, if you want to release that song, you have to get the splits sorted out, you know, pretty sharpish. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it, 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 is, it is always... Trust me, we we st I continue to make this mistake, and um, and it was it's mainly on the master side, the, you know, on the publishing side. I think you get to a point where you understand that if there's three in the room, it's three ways. Four in the room, it's four ways. And and unless there is an absolute anomaly where somebody just plays their video games on their phone for the whole session, then I think it's okay. Say, hey, look, you know, the, the, this is just doesn't seem fair. But it, I I've, I don't think I've ever come across it. You know, I've had sessions where 
I was incredibly active and doing most of the writing. And I've had sometimes when I literally was just supporting the other writers and helping them kind of go through all their ideas and kind of keeping keeping things on track in terms of making sure the, the song has got a center and a concept and an idea and the melodies are right. So it's not, you know, it's more of an arrangement sort of idea. So I think, um, I think it's, as Pam said, it's always best to just kind of go with this idea. And most writers that you work with that have been around the block a few times will always expect it to be that way. Um, and it's kind of an unwritten rule. But th at the end of the session, it's always go, you know, I would I say, hey, so we're just splitting this three ways, right? And everybody j always goes, well, of course. But it's always good to make sure that you have that conversation. And it's not in a conversation you should feel embarrassed about because... Trust me, if you don't do it and then money starts rolling in, it becomes way more complicated and way more unpleasant. So, um, and, and I made a mistake just recently presuming about master splits because I'm a producer, writer, um, and... and, and it, what master splits are, Rich. Yeah, well, the master is a completely separate um, copyright and everybody views that copyright slightly differently. I come from the tradition of the copyright master copyright is whoever generates the recording of that copyright so in most cases that will be the producer and the artist because the artist is singing on it and doing you know a number of stuff obviously further down like an artist will get a piece of the master through their royalty rate from a record company because traditionally it was always the record company owns the master because they paid to have it produced right so they own the master recording and that's why you can have several master recordings associated to one publishing copyright so if you know for instance you know yesterday by paul mccartney has been covered what five thousand million times and every single one of those recordings has its own master copyright attached to it and whoever paid for it or did all the grunt work producing that that's their copyright. So I made a presumption because I, I, I split my copyright, mastering copyright 50-50 with the artist. And, um, and that wasn't how some the, 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 the group saw it because they've never done it that way before. So it, it, cr it was something that we left till afterwards and it, was, it wasn't an issue, it was just we didn't have that chat ahead of time and I think that would have been a wise conversation to have so get it all out in the open I think that's the best way to do it you know if you're going to write on top of track that's being sent out to you don't be don't be surprised if that's expected to get 50% of the publishing um, a lot of the you know DJ producers 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 um, who send track out that's that's the that's normally the given that top line will receive 50% and the track receives 50%. And then the top line could be just you or it could be three or four of you. And in some cases, the track could be nine people. And we've seen that where you've got a song that comes out and it has you know, 12, 14 people sharing that, the writing copyright. So um, Pam is so correct, you double check. If you work into track, make sure you know how many people have actually put that track together because sometimes it can be multitudes of people. You know. And find out how many people have got that track because yeah. you know, the producer might have sent that track to five other people. Um, and I've done that for big, for big artists as well. Mm -hmm. You know, big producers sending sending that track out um, years ago for Celine Dion in different directions. And then, you know, um, the song that ends up uh, sounded a little bit like mine and um, that was not okay. You know, they didn't go with mine, but they like you you hear a melody that sounds a little bit like mine. So you've got to be super careful, uh, and you learn to work with the people you trust, um, yeah. you know, along the way, um, that 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 don't do a dirty on you and 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 go well, you know, you're not getting as much as you thought you were. Yeah, and and that's a good point actually. That that track people do send it out to a lot of people, um, and make sure you it's mentioned somewhere in an email that if they do not use the top line, the top line remains the property of you and you can are free to use it anywhere else. In, in the actual law of the land is as soon as music comes together, harmony and lyric and melody, it creates a copyright and it is fused together and cannot be separated. 
that those those lines have been smudged and moved around all over the place so if you're doing a lot of that and i did a lot of that when i was doing a lot of dance music probably five six years ago but a bit more longer ago than that when i was doing a lot of top line on those sorts of tracks and, and me and my writing partner always specified if you don't use it we are going to maintain ownership of that part the top line and we are free to use it somewhere else and that actually happened and it turned into a big dance record for somebody else because we ended up going with another another track so so yeah again dot your i's cross your t's and when it comes to money and i know that was part of your question i think zoe i think it's um you know you again if you're being asked to do a vocal session <clears throat> ask them up front you know what do you pay and what are you paying for me to come in and record my vocal and does that is that a work for hire Am I being removed from the copyright from that? Any potential earnings from the back end? Uh, and make sure you do it. And if they do, then there's got to be a piece of paperwork to say you are no longer part of this. You have paid and you are now just a featured vocalist on there. And that's it. Yeah. And uh, I'll lead in. Oh, I apologize for uh, cutting you off. Um, I just want to make sure we have plenty of time for the ending part there. I want to lead into the next question, kind of connecting to this as well, um, because there are uh, a lot of PROs out there um, that songwriters are a part of, uh, the three main ones being BMI, ASCAP, and CSAC. Yeah. And uh, what should you consider in uh, choosing your PRO? And I know that PROs, when it comes to splits too, they do play a part just because the songwriters belong to different PROs. So the, that could also be a factor in how things are being divvied up and not necessarily like because this person's with this PRO, they get less in any way. It's just, I've heard can make things more complicated if two songwriters are collaborating and they belong to two different PROs. So, um, but that I might be mistaken on that, but what should you consider in choosing one? Um, um, yeah, well, in choosing one, um, uh, really down to the people, you know, and resonating with the people. Um, ASCAP have, uh, they, they all have their own events that go on throughout throughout the year. ASCAP have the ASCAP experience. Um, obviously, everything is still virtual at the moment. Um, but um, go to these events, pay to go to these events before you join them, if you know, if you can, and get to know the people. Um, it's all down to who you resonate with as as um, the team around you, uh, like anything really. But uh, ask your friends, ask your friends who they're with and see who, if they're happy with, you know, what the, what they, who, who they've signed to. Um, it's not true what you said with regard to, you, you, you shouldn't collaborate with somebody in a different PRO. There was, um, um, a situation a, a couple years ago that was going to be a possibility of uh, licensing thing where where it was going to affect with who you were going to write to yeah but it, that has not happened um but uh no you can write with anybody anybody in any different pro and there are obviously different pros around the world um most countries have one america has five two two private ones um, CSAC and GMR and um, ASCAP and BMI are um, under the cons consent degrees, which we won't go into, but um, they're more government, um, government controlled. controlled. Yeah, yeah, absolutely what Pam said. It's, it's all about who you fit with and, and you feel comfortable going with. You know the money in terms of what your earnings are can fluctuate a little bit from um, to, uh, PRO to PRO, but I think it all evens out in the end. I think um, I think it's important to find your champion, and that may be you know CSAC, that might be BMI, that might be ASCAP, and uh, and and you go with who you think is right. You know Pam's with ASCAP, I'm with BMI. You know so, and we both get you know a lot of love from our from our PRO so and they are our friends you yeah. know they really are they they work for songwriters and um the organizations are great they have events that go on workshops that you can get involved in they're there to help the songwriters yeah. so they also fight for us in court um to help get up get the rates up so um definitely seek out 
uh, your your PRO and um, you know find out ways of getting involved in what they what they're doing. Yeah, get registered. Yeah, definitely. And that's actually something I really wanted to say. You know, because we talked about splits. It's so important that you figure out the business side and you make sure that you do your due diligence on um, you know, getting all the information through for your songwriters, writing out, have some, have a go-to place. I, I work through Master Writer that I, I put all my uh, information, my co-writer's information, because one day you might go back to a song and go, oh, who did I write that with? And how much of a split did I get? You know, you have to register it with the PROs to get all your um you know, if you want to earn money, then you need to register with the PRO. Yeah, you won't get a performance penny unless that unless it's registered. So yeah, really important to do yeah, the business. Totally. Yeah. So obviously, you guys are so very well informed about everything. This is, has this has been great. Uh, I just hmm. want to say thank you. But uh, you know, we need to know why we're here. We need to know what is Songwriter Camps. Why did you guys uh, co-found it? What what made you want to start such an awesome thing? Oh, thank you, Zoe. Well, I just I want to thank you guys because um, it's so wonderful to have you on board and have your help. Um, you know, when we started this out, we just started one camp uh, in 2018, was it really? Yeah, 2018, yeah. We kind of, oh, we met like, 13 years ago um, at a songwriting festival and became friends first and then became co-writers and um, and um, you know decided that we wanted to start a, a, a camp and do something on the side of writing songs to help songwriters with the craft of songwriting songwriting we're really passionate about songwriting and um, helping people make their songs better and um the whole creative process and um i think uh we went to a lot of these conventions and expos and um people were presenting songs to music supervisors and a and r and they weren't really ready you know we found that there's a sort of a there was a kind of a gap in the market where songwriters needed a little bit of direction and help on 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 stuff and it it sort of just happened organically mm. um, with this camp. And um, we did one camp and then more people said, hey, we want to come to another camp. And we did another and we ended up doing three before the pandemic. And um, and then we went online and now we do um, a meet and critique workshop every month. And we've just built um, a website out and I'll let, I'll let Rich tell you some more about that. Yeah, I mean, just to dovetail off of that, really, I think, you know, Pam and I are passionate about what we do. We've enjoy, we enjoy a bit of mentoring as well. And we're both full time writers still and producers, you know, where our day gig is still there and we're still pounding out the music, you know, and, and, and we're continuing to learn as well as the business changes, you know. Uh, and just not in the Pam, you know, with Pam and at Sona and figuring out how we're going to navigate this in, uh, for ourselves, but really importantly, what, the next generation of writers that are coming through. So, you know, the camp was, you know, a, such an important part of that as for, for the reasons Pam said in terms of helping people make a better connection when they have an opportunity to present their music, where they've got you know, you can't teach people a lot of things in terms of inspiration. I mean, you can show people how to get inspired and talent is something that's just an innate part of people's DNA, I think. But you can teach the craft of songwriting. You can tell people things to change and things to work on to find a way to take those inspired ideas and turn it into something that's very palatable for, for an audience, not just the pop audience, but any audience, no matter what the genre of music you're, you're writing. And, uh, and, and that's why we've, you know, we started and, and it's kind of, and the pandemic did us a bit of a favor, really, not, not because we missed doing the camps, we didn't want to do the in-person camps, we loved doing that, but it gave us an opportunity to take it online. So, we then discover that that's a, a, a great way of teaching 
through and, and keeping costs down so that we can make it affordable. And, and with the new website, we've now built like two plans really for, for songwriters. A songwriting sort of course, which starts off with a boot camp to a workout camp to the master camp. So you're learning through various different facets of the business um, and the craft of songwriting. And then we do exactly the same thing for you know writing for sync. So taking it from the very bare bones and the nuts and bolts of sync through to the you know the how to write for sync and actually writing for sync and then through to the master camp where you're writing four actual briefs that have been brought by music supervisors and we literally just finished one last week so so yeah it's it's been a it's been a wonderful experience and and we're uh, and we're we're building it out all the time and and um, it takes <laughs> and it's exhausting. <laughs> it is exhausting um, but it's it's fun because we get to meet I mean you guys have just been an absolute godsend I mean we can't thank you both enough for, for all you do behind the scenes since you've come on board and for helping us put together this webinar it's been an absolute delight so um, and, and really this is what we're trying to do is is, is give people like yourselves an opportunity to, to learn about this business um, from people that have been around the mill a little bit and, and, and are still doing it too. So we're still engaged in the industry and we're still you know we're working and I think that uh, that helps us kind of rejig things as it goes along as the business changes, you know. And the yeah. business has changed. Yes, <laughs> a lot. A lot. It's, it's, yeah. Yeah. it's changing rapidly and and i'm still trying to like figure out the the basics here and i think you're absolutely right pam about there being a gap in the industry of like people who know how to you know i don't know how to reach out to music supervisors or get my music seen uh by people um you know important people who need to see it for sync opportunities <coughs> or important collaborations and i really appreciate you guys providing a service to help fill that gap help fill that gap in the knowledge because uh, you guys are veterans, you know what you're talking about. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not sure yeah. if I appreciate the veteran word, but never mind. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah, even from old veterans. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> from being able to sit in and like see these camps and see like the meet and critiques as well, it just it like i know i've learned so much in the short time that i've gotten to work with you both and i i really really appreciate being a part of this and being able to learn from you and the people that you bring in and also meet like what's really great about the meeting critiques is and along with the camps especially online right now i'm meeting people from all over the world who yeah. are like other creatives and i think it's fantastic that you're bringing everybody together it's Thanks. really a wonderful thing <laughs> oh thank you we appreciate you know that thanks you know we, we do a fair bit of mentoring so it's it's wonderful to be able to connect people um and for people to find each other online i mean how else would you find somebody in paris you know in different in a different country so yeah um we love doing it and um you know we're going to keep doing it and um you know if anyone wants to look us up uh, we're on www.songwritercamps.com and um, yeah, uh, we do a monthly workshop and, and a ton of new, new camps. Yeah, and we're probably going to do a few more of these webinars as well before the year's out, maybe one more before the year's out. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, and, and uh, sign up to our mailing list. We'll always take suggestions as well. So if you're, you know, if you think of something, you think, well, it'd be really nice to hear Pam and, and, and Richard's kind of thinking on that then let us know. Um, we're, we're, we're always open to ideas about what we can do to engage with you guys out there and helping you kind of navigate this uh, this whole journey. And it Absolutely. is a journey. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Just want to thank everyone who tuned in, even if it was just for a few minutes. Uh, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn under the handle Songwriter Camps. You can also find us at www.songwritercamps.com. Uh, we hope to see you at one of the camps very soon. Uh, this is the wonderful Richard Harris. This is the wonderful Pam Shane. I'm Zoe Fontenot. This is Alyssa Call. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And we'll thank you, guys. Thank you so much, and we'll see you at the next one.